Sorry to bring you down with some doom and gloom. But I have a, a story to tell. The earth would quake and quake and quake again. And the water was flowing all over. Everything then drifted away. Everything was lost and gone. This is the battle of Thunderbird and Whale. Happened a long time ago. Nobody knows how long. And it's woven into the art and the, and the stories of the Native Americans of the Pacific Northwest. Hundreds of years later, in 1969, we were walking on the moon. And it may be arguably the most advanced thing humans have ever done. At that time, plate tectonics, the defining theory of all Earth science, was only six years old. Just think about that for a second. So, when Sheldon talks about geology being the Kardashians of science, he's actually not wrong. <laughs> There's a lot of reality in that show. And so geology, we're in geology, I hate to say, but we're, and I get to say this because I'm a geologist, but we're about 100 years behind the other sciences. So plate tectonics defined how the Earth works. We have plate boundaries where new crust is formed, blocks slide side by side, and old crust is destroyed, and everything we think of as solid is really moving. And we live in the Cascadia subduction zone, that's what this area is called, and about 25 miles, 50 kilometers beneath our feet, the Juan de Fuca plate uh, is slip sliding away, that way, I think, northeast, at about 40 millimeters a year. That's about how fast your fingernails grow. So you can't feel this or see it, but it's all moving. So back in the 1960s, some students at Oregon State University and University of Washington were studying sedimentology, grain by grain, really boring stuff, offshore. And they took cores with a, with a big ship like this, and it's basically a big lawn dart that collects a, uh, a sample in some, in some uh, uh, four-inch sprinkler pipe, simple stuff. And what they found was turbidites. And what you see there is layers, just little sand layers stacked up nice and evenly. And what these are is just little submarine landslides where sand rolls downhill and lands on the seafloor. And they studied these in great detail, all the sedimentology, the grain by grain details, and they worked this all out. And then they moved on to other things in life for the most part. So Cascadia, here it is, here's a map of it. We're in Portland, Oregon. It goes from Northern California up to the middle of Vancouver Island, BC. It's 1,000 kilometers long, about 700 miles. And so when plate tectonics uh, was initiated, when, when, it, when the theory came about in 1961 or two, Cascadia was one of the places where, that helped demonstrate the new theory. Seafloor spreading, it was called then. And, uh, and so at the time, it explained almost everything. The ring of fire, the rows of volcanoes, the rows of earthquakes, all of a sudden, things that had no explanation, literally before 1961 or so, were pretty well explained. But there was one little problem. There was one place in the world that didn't fit, and it turned out to be Cascadia. And it was because Cascadia was missing something that all other subduction zones and major faults had. It was missing earthquakes. There were no earthquakes on a daily basis, monthly, yearly, or, anybody, or that anyone could remember into the past. And so it became this enigma. And so... Um, People are attracted to enigmas and want to explain this thing, but this one became the elephant in the corner, and people kind of tiptoed around it and went, well, this theory explains pretty much everything except this one. And sometimes elephants in the corner just sit there and people walk around them for a long time. And so through the rest of the 60s and 70s, people walked around this one, and they had some ideas about it. One idea was that sediments from the Columbia River maybe lubricated the plate boundary, and it was really slip-sliding way, just very quietly and smoothly. And that was... Not a great idea, but it was popular because, <laughs> for obvious reasons. And then there was, a, there was a second idea that maybe we couldn't just resolve the fact that uh, Cascadia had stopped. It had just sort of frozen, anatomically correct. Everything was perfect, it just wasn't moving anymore. And we didn't have GPS, and so we didn't have a way to check that. But there was a third possibility. <laughs> I know how old... Some of you are, but you're laughing. <laughs> 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 
There was a third possibility that nobody had counted upon, and that, that was that the plate boundary was completely locked, just tight as a drum, and it couldn't get a squeak out. That wasn't a good, that wasn't a good popular idea. In 1985, a Canadian geologist named John Adams was the very first guy to suggest there was actually evidence of past earthquakes that were so far back that nobody knew anything about them. And what he found was, guess what? Turbidites, those same layers the students had worked on in the 1960s. And so here's, a, here's the same map, but with some core sites on it. And the white ones, if you can see the white dots, were collected by the same OSU students, and he looked, he looked at that data, the same data they looked at 20 years before, and he saw something a little different. What he saw was the same turbidites, but he also saw, as they did, there was an ash layer out there from Mount Mazama, Crater Lake, blown up 7,600 years ago, left ash all over the place, and it was in the deep sea in these turbidites. And what he found was, in the 13th turbidite down, was where the ash appeared not just in one place, but in all places, from southern Oregon up through northern Washington. And he thought, well, that's kind of a coincidence. Why would you have, you know, this, these things can be caused by landslides, by storms, by all sorts of things. Why would you have the same number in all these different places? And then he noticed also there was a stream confluence, and up there at the top of the slide you can see there are two, two uh, submarine channels, and these are, these are submarine rivers carrying sediment, just like rivers on land do. And two of them came together in a confluence and went further down uh, you know, towards uh, California. And he noticed that there were not only 13 of these turbidites in a lot of places, there were 13 on each side of this confluence. And so he thought, well, that's kind of a, that's even more of a coincidence. If these things were synchronous all over the place, that would mean that they're probably earthquakes. And so he looked at that. The problem is, with radiocarbon dating, which is kind of our tools of the trade, you can't get to within maybe 50 or 80 years at most, and he needed to know if they happened at the same time, within a few hours. So how do you do that in 1985? How do you do that any time? You cheat. <laughs> so he saw these things on two, both sides of the confluence and realized that if you go downstream and have the same number, that means that they did get there at the same time, plus or minus a couple of hours. And so without leaving his office, without dating anything, without going to sea, he just used the fax core logs from OSU and figured out that there had been 13 great earthquakes in 7,000 years. Not bad. So we're starting to catch up with the other sciences a little bit. And that was kind of game over for Cascadia. We knew then that we'd gone from a completely aseismic subduction zone to magnitude 9 generator, uh, just with one abstract written by John Adams. Of course, nobody paid any attention to that at first. <laughs> but later on, a couple of years later, Brian At uh, Atwater found deposits that look like this. And what this is is a marsh deposit in Willapa Bay. And you can see there's a marsh growing on top of the thing. And the black deposit below that is an old marsh, about 300 years old. And it, um, it had been buried, apparently. And marshes, these marshes are really sensitive to water levels. And so they can't grow a meter apart. So he figured that either the sea level had changed or the land level had changed. The land level changing is harder to come by, but that's what happened. And it didn't happen over time, it happened in a few minutes. And that sand layer, the light-colored layer in between there, that's a tsunami sand sheet. So this is what the evidence of great earthquakes really looks like. And you can see in the black layer, those two, those two dips in it, those are Native American fire pits. So this washed through Willapa Bay, took out a Native American village at the time, and left behind this evidence. And you can find this in every single bay all along Cascadia. And so at the end, Kenji Sataki, a colleague, uh, put the nail in the coffin and found evidence of a tsunami that arrived in Japan in the year 1700 without the benefit of an earthquake. And they come in pairs, and they were very used to that. And Japan had very detailed written histories of this event that had arrived, and it became known as the orphan tsunami. And Satake-san modeled it and found out the only reasonable source for it was the Pacific Northwest. And so that's how we know now that the last Cascadia Great Earthquake was in the year 1700, in January, on the 26th, about 9 o'clock at night. The Native Americans they said, why didn't you just ask us? We knew about that. <laughs> and 
And they did. They just called it Thunderbird and Whale, the great battle. So since then, we've been working in Cascadia, a lot of us over the years, working in all sorts of diverse environments, and we find evidence for these earthquakes everywhere, including Bull Run Lake, which this is a picture of, uh, just uphill on, on the western side of Mount Hood. So in the end, this is what a summary looks like of 43 great earthquakes going back 10,000 years, and now we have, we've gone from the worst known subduction zone in the world to the best. We have the best record of any place in the world. Great. From the science side, this is great. From the people side, not so much. So we've got a bit of a problem because we built all our big cities of Vancouver, Victoria, Portland, Seattle, all of them. We built all of these on a time bomb, not knowing it. Remember, this was 1961 in plate tectonics. And so we have unreinforced masonry buildings by the thousands that look like this. We have 300 or so bridges built without building codes. Some of them look so spindly, they don't look like they'd stand up in a good breeze. <laughs> and we have a thousand of these just in Oregon alone and 3,000 in the Northwest. Unreinforced masonry schools. So what does a culture who, who's had a head start on this, like Japan, do about this? Now, this is the public safety building in Minami Sanriku, Japan, after the 2011 tsunami. The, what's in the background is where the town was. It's now a meadow, and this is the last building standing in Minami Sanriku. And we met, uh, some of us met the mayor of, Mayor Sato of Minami Sanriku. And in this building, 48 people died while they were broadcasting messages about the incoming tsunami, and they stayed at their posts. The mayor and about 10 people survived hanging on to uh, the cell tower on top, and somebody snapped the pic this picture of their town during the tsunami. So someday in the Pacific Northwest, someone is going to have this view of their town as well. This is now a certainty. It's the most airtight case in science that I know of. And so we have choices to make, and the question is, what are we going to do about this? We have to retrofit entire cities, and we have to prepare the coastal areas, luckily not Portland, for a tsunami. And so we have a lot to learn, we have decisions to make, and I'll just show you one example. So this is um, a sandbar in the middle of Yukuna Bay. Some of you may know this is the Hatfield Marine Science Center and the EPA and NOAA and other folks agencies have buildings on this site and, and they're feeling pretty nervous about it because they're right smack in the tsunami zone. And so when the, when the earthquake comes, the land will sub subside about a meter and 15 or 20 minutes later, the tsunami will roll in and remove pretty much everything on this sandbar. So OSU, my own school, is planning on building a new high occupancy school structure on this sandbar right now as we speak. So you've got to wonder, <laughs> <laughs> faced with all the knowledge we have about Cascadia, is this a great idea? And so I'll just leave you with Mayor Sato, who grew up in Minami Sanriku, and in Japan, they don't mess around with tsunamis and earthquakes, they do something. And Mayor Sato is raising the entire base level of his town and is going to put the town back on top of it, four meters higher than that meadow that you saw on the slide. So in Oregon, we have choices. In the Pacific Northwest, we have choices. And I ask you, if Mayor Sato was the mayor of Newport, what would he do? And in other towns, all up and down the coast, we have the same choice. We can either prepare and get ready for something we know about, or we can just let it happen. Thank you very much.